galaxy. The Omnitrix is in the hands of a mere child. Don't you ever pause to consider your actions at all? He risked his life a hundred times for people he didn't even know. Well, the legendary Ben Tennyson. I am one of everybody. It's up to someone to protect this planet. And like it or not, I think it's up to us. I know you can do it. I believe in you. It's hero time! So, what do we do now? The only thing we can do, go back at the beginning. In October 2016, the world was introduced to the Ben 10 reboot, which, like most reboots, was immediately met with controversy and disapproval. The original continuity ran from 2005 to 2014, building an audience of multiple generations of kids and teens. With nine years worth of character development and lore, it's tough to see it all go away, and then replaced. I was among the many who felt disappointment when I watched the first few episodes, although not for the more common reasons to dislike the reboot. I felt the art style was very inspired and fresh, and appreciate the characters actually had shading. While most recent animated programs lead towards flat colors and simpler shapes. These designs look very fluid in animation as well, and while it took some getting used to, I'm fond of the changes and improvements to the alien designs like Stinkfly, Accelerate, and Humongousaur. The reason I held such a strong disregard for the reboot was simply because it was in fact replacing the original continuity. Now, of course, it's not like I can't just go back and watch the old episodes and enjoy them all the same. That's pretty much the basis of these videos. But the show has always been struck with retcons, weird plot decisions, and inconsistent tone and execution of the character and their abilities. By the later seasons of Omniverse, the timeline was basically cleaned up with actual canon reasons to all the changes of the lore. It's the Star Dudes. It's always the Star Dudes. The world was expanded upon like never before, and a huge supporting cast which was fleshed out and frequently relevant, not to mention how powerful Ben had gotten towards the end. Seeing Ben climb so high only for him to just start all over again, well, you get the point. But the reboot has been out for quite some time now, and expanded on its own lore over the past two and a quarter seasons. It may have started out strictly episodic, but it's made respectable efforts to stand out and prove itself worthy of being its own show, whether you compare it to the original or not. And I have to admit, I'm very impressed with certain decisions they've made, and story elements they've created, and I think the fandom deserves to give it a second chance. In fact, there are things that the reboot does that are arguably better than what any of the first four shows have ever done. For the past few weeks, the Ink Tank and I have studied the episodes and gotten feedback from parts of the fandom, and we've put together what we believe to be the key elements that make the reboot respectably good. Stay tuned to see what the fans had to say about what they enjoy. But for now, I'm Kuro the Artist. I'm Hershey Lee. And I'm O.R. Ash. And we're here to tell you the top five things that the reboot does better than the original franchise. Ben and Gwen's relationship is one of the most notable changes of the show. In the first series, Gwen and Ben would constantly fight with each other to try to claim the higher ground. But in the reboot, they do still bicker, but it's largely toned down. They seem to genuinely enjoy each other's presence and tease each other with friendly competition that also helps them better one another. They're also openly less selfish and don't hide their feelings when they're worried about each other. I have to say, this is a lot more entertaining to watch. While yes, it is realistic for younger kids not to get along, insult each other, and complain about, well, everything. It does get old very fast. After a while, their bickering is a chore to sit through, and by the time you get to season 4, you'd think they'd tone it down a notch, but it takes up just as much screen time as any other episode. It felt like they were fighting because the writers couldn't think of any other way for them to interact in the scene, and it definitely takes away from the story. Removing their constant quarrels works great for the new 11-minute format. It also presents much more positive behavior for the younger audience, setting a great example. The way they interact with each other seems more like their siblings than cousins, as they appear to be much more more comfortable and communicative towards each other. Friendly banter is good to help keep everyone in check, but deep down you should always be there for your family. And the reboot does a fantastic job at presenting this positive family dynamic. The transformation sequences in the series are the most unique out of all the other four. The first series had a single set transformation for every alien. These transformations are gorgeous and probably look the best out of all of them, but since they're the same thing every time, it almost feels like you're sitting through a video game cutscene after they've been showcased quite a few times. The next two series tried switching things up, but there wasn't a solid balance between good transformation sequences and bad ones, and not every alien got one. These series also use transformation sequences the least amount of times, mostly just going with a simple flash. 
omniverses were a step in the right direction, but again, only sometimes. After a while, the transformations just looked like Ben putting on a onesie very slowly, and others went by far too quickly to appreciate. It seemed like they were focusing more on fancy camera angles than actual transforming. The reboot is brilliant with their transformations. They're beautifully animated and show the personality and abilities of the aliens through very visually creative means. There's also multiple transformations for every alien, so every episode, you might see Ben turn into the same alien in a different way, which keeps things fresh. Some even get up to five or six unique transformation sequences, not to mention that these transformations get an additional bumper of upgrades in Season 2, when the Omni Enhancements are introduced. When Ben goes an alien in the reboot, the transformations alone can get you hyped. And it's not just the transformations either. The reboot is expanding its own roster with unique alien transformation, as so far, every single one of them has been good. None of these aliens seem like filler transformations. You can tell the crew put a lot of close attention to detail in each one of them. So let's take a quick look at what new aliens the reboot has to offer. Shockrock is my personal favorite out of all of the new reboot aliens. He's a large mass of blue energy covered in minerals that plate his body like a suit of armor. He can manipulate this energy into a handful of weapons, shields, and various attacks, and could even absorb and redirect certain kinds of plasma like Vilgax's laser attacks. This alien was the theme of the entire second season. His DNA pod started leaking into Ben's other transformations, upgrading them with similar weaponry. Starting off Season 3, we get a look at the newest reboot exclusive, Slapback. He's a duplicating alien like Ditto with a more unique twist than Echo Echo. Every time he splits, each clone becomes heavier, denser, and stronger. So far, we've only seen him duplicate up to about 8 clones at a time, but duplicating yourself into a small squad with an 8 times power multiplier? That sounds like a great deal to me. Heading back to Season 1, Overflow took up the mantle as Reboot Ben's water transformation. A lot of people claimed that he was a bootleg water hazard, but he's about as close to water hazard as Buzz Shock is to Frankenstrike. Similar powers doesn't mean similar aliens. Overflow can form constructs out of water produced from his body, similar to Aqualad from Young Justice. His water propulsion attacks are noticeably stronger than water hazard, and he can project himself into the air with them as a form of flight. Lastly, we have Gax, who, you guessed it, is Ben's Vilgax transformation. But if we're gonna get into this, let's head over to the third official topic. The reboot takes a lot of liberties when adapting previous characters into this new continuity, like how Darkstar became a child actor and Charmcaster was a self-taught human, and the crew pulled no punches when they decided to take Vilgax in a separate direction as well. This Vilgax was somehow split into two halves before the start of the series, and one half was locked within the Omnitrix to prevent Vilgax from reaching full power. Before it was removed, this gave Ben temporary access to his powers as an alien transformation, but Vilgax was eventually able to restore his true form and became a reoccurring antagonist of the series. Now note how we said antagonist and not villain, because unlike the original Vilgax, this one isn't blindly evil. He's power hungry, yes, but this doesn't lead him to be emotionless, isolated, arrogant, and vengeful. He's also extremely wise and has even shared his knowledge with Ben on multiple accounts seeming to develop a twisted teacher-student relationship with him. He's also not vengeful towards Ben and views him more like an inconvenience than an actual enemy. It's very interesting to see Vilgax with more of a personality. This is something that Omniverse attempted, but it ended up compromising his intimidating nature in favor of this. Reboot Vilgax is both intimidating and has a personality, and is probably the best version of Vilgax we've ever had. He also retains his laser vision from Alien Force, but can also now unravel his arms into tentacles, which is a brilliant design choice. He is also voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, who voiced the teenage version of Ben previously. You can hear Yuri go into more detail about landing the role and performing as Vilgax in the reboot in our interview with him. Link will be down below. It's no secret that Ben 10 thrives off of its toy sales. Lack of sales is what gave Omniverse the boot. So the reboot took no chances with superb merchandise, and boy does it show. The reboot has an excellent strategy with toy sales, as it constantly finds new ways to build a large toy line with a broad idea, and also lines up with whatever is happening in the current season. The first season was able to get the main cast of heroes and villains, including all 10 aliens, out on the shelves with fresh packaging worldwide. The second season introduced us to the 
Omni Enhancements, which automatically gives every alien a second version, perfect for a new toy line. Season 3 is said to incorporate vehicles as well, but unlike the previous vehicle toys, these ones will actually be a part of the show. It should also be noted that these figures are very well made. Their molding and details are noticeably more refined than the previous figures, and have much more points of articulation. The reboot is also the first series to successfully replicate the full screen silhouette effect that the Omnitrix displays when activated. While the first four series grew to be very selective with what they would adapt into a toy, the reboot makes everything a toy. Of course, not every toy turns out to be a success. Shock rock, more like a load of crock. But the majority of these figures my generation would have killed to have when we were kids. Best thing I had was a heat blast flashlight. Now, this may sound like a cop-out for the final part of our list, but the reboot doing its own thing benefits the show in ways that none of the previous incarnations have attempted. The show likes to use comedy to move the plot forward, a recurring example being how none of the civilians are ever phased by the fact that Ben can turn into aliens, or that aliens exist in general. Not having to worry about if anyone sees Ben transform saves the writers a lot of time having to figure out how Ben is going to hide, or what excuse he's going to make. Even when the world found out about Ben's secret and ultimate alien, new problems were introduced to replace the old ones, like avoiding paparazzi and trying to maintain a positive reputation in the public eye. This freedom from realistic logic also allows the show to be extremely creative with the characters' interactions and how they expand the universe. Spoilers ahead if you're not caught up. In Season 3, Kevin builds his own Omnitrix from a dream he had and is able to make modifications to it. This should break so many rules when you think about it logistically, but the reboot just moves forward, and then we get an awesome fight with the newly reintroduced Humongosaur in it. So for this series, it works. The fourth wall is also visually broken regularly when Ben gives one of his narratives. Words would fly into screen, there's multiple uses of dream vision, and there's even art shifts thrown in sometimes. Certain objects and backgrounds throughout the show even feature their own unique texturing, like Diamond Head's crystals or the backgrounds of the transformation scenes. The reboot even makes efforts to expand the lore past the show itself with an online miniseries called Ben 10 Worlds including fully illustrated and narrated micro-documentaries about the species and home planets of Ben's transformations. In the original franchise, the only time we ever got any additional information on Ben's aliens were quick one-liners, or if they actually went to the home planet itself. We did get info cards with the action figures, but their legitimacy was debatable as the show eventually contradicted a few of these cards in future episodes. All of these assets factor into the lighter and faster tone of the show very effectively. In this day and age, Franchises getting rebooted happen so often that it's beginning to outweigh the production of original content. And more often than not, the reboot is far, far worse than the original. This pretense makes it hard for a lot of people to accept the reboot, but with what we've seen, it's really not bad. It's got great characters, great action, fun moments, and the cast and crew prioritize making a good product than a simple cash grab. So why is there still a ton of passionate hate for the show? Similar to what Kuro said at the start of this video, it's all about letting go of the comparison factor to the original series. The two versions are meant to serve different purposes and market themselves to different audiences. This brings up the topic of family-friendly content versus adolescent programming. Average consumers often like to brand any content that is family-friendly as simply kids shows without any regard for the actual content of the program. They're under the impression that if a show lacks extreme violence, language, or sexual intentions, it must be for kids, right? It sounds ridiculous, but this is actually a rising mentality that you yourself might be guilty of without realizing it. However, creators and companies have proven above and beyond that compelling and interesting stories can be told while staying within family-friendly guidelines. Some examples are Pixar movies, daytime TV, and even most music. If a song doesn't have any swears or mature content in it, that doesn't mean that song is for kids. The original franchise was a show that grew up with its fans, and while it generally stayed within family-friendly guidelines, it wasn't afraid to track bolder subjects, like Stockholm Syndrome, wrongful imprisonment, and even self-sacrifice. It knew it had a wide variety in its own audience and did the best to please everyone with various storylines and tones. The reboot is more strongly a kid's show, but that doesn't make it bad either. The reboot at its core is attempting to please a much younger audience, and the fact that it's already into its third season proves it's being successful in its own nature. However, strictly being a kid's show makes it a lot harder for previous fans to connect, who are used to the bolder tones of the original Ben 10. The reboot has done some admirably impressive story choices, but it's doubtful that it'll ever go as far as the predecessor did with death and raw emotion. 
That's not to say that these more mature storylines make the original better than the reboot. In fact, I have another video on that subject as well, link below. But these storylines imply we are dealing with a much more relatable universe, which is hard to tackle in an adolescent-targeted show, specifically when it is sci-fi orientated. All in all, the OG was made for one kind of audience, and the reboot was made for another. So the former's audience not being attracted to the latter's makes perfect sense. But that doesn't mean the show is bad. I think the reboot deserves another chance. And even if you end up not liking it, you should at least respect the fact that it is Ben 10. And honestly, I'm just happy that the legacy of Ben 10 is still going. Maybe years down the line, Ben 10 will get some ultra gritty reboot to please all the stubborn Ben 1er purists. But for now on, let's give the Ben 10 reboot our full support. You can always go check out Five Years Later, an adaptation showing what could have happened if Omniverse kept going. But remember, the story isn't over, Ben. When the moment comes, you'll do what needs to be done. That is your great gift. But what do you guys think? I clipped together some comments from the Ink Tank server as well as the official Ben 10 Discord, and was going to sprinkle them throughout the video, but that made scripting a correct narrative that we agreed with very challenging. So I'm just gonna showcase them here. Maybe I can make showcasing comments a regular thing. Anyways, thanks for checking out our video. To support projects like these, please consider joining our Patreon. You can stay up to date with all of our projects on my social media, and join the Discord to discuss this episode with other passionate fans. And as always, keep it fizzy. Hey, hey.